Hello all, and welcome back to the YouTube channel of All Day Chess TV. Thank you guys so much for your support lately, and if you want to see more epic videos like this, please be sure to subscribe, like, comment, and share the videos with friends and family. Okay, without further ado, you must have realized based on the thumbnail that today we are going to be covering supposedly the greatest move of all time. This is still very controversial, there's still many great moves out there, but personally, this has been one that's getting very famous on the chess community, and one that almost everyone knows. So, this will be a GM game analysis video where we're going to analyze the game and the move that completely shocked and changed the chess world. So, this game was played between Stefan Levitsky and Frank Marshall. Frank Marshall here played the black pieces, and he was the one who made the brilliant move. So, let's see. So the game starts out with d4, and then e6, e4, d5. Here what happens is that this is a French defense. It's transposed into a French defense. White here has two main center pawns, and black here, his pawns aren't as well placed, but he has a very solid structure. So then what happens is we have knight c3, and then we have c5. As you might have seen based on the Hikaru and Mr. Beast videos, Hikaru also went for counterplay in the center, and that's exactly what black is doing here, playing c5 to get in the center and to aggravate it. Oh, I also forgot to mention, this game was called the Golden Coin Game, just because of the amazing move that Frank Marshall played, that people showered gold coins. So, after c5, we have knight f3, we have knight c6, and then we have e takes d5, e takes d5, and then bishop e2. So now white is getting ready to castle, and black still needs to develop a couple more pieces before he can castle. So now what happens is, after bishop e2, we have knight f6 developing our pieces, white castles, and black also plays bishop e7, getting ready to castle, and then white comes out with bishop g5. This is just pinning the piece to maybe cause some trouble later on in the game. And then we have castles, and then after castles, we have d takes e5, and then instead of playing bishop takes e5, we have a very a uh, bishop takes e5. We have a very nice developing move, bishop e6, guarding this d5 square. And after we have bishop e6, we have knight to d4, maybe to trade off these pieces and then get some attack on f6. But this isn't the greatest move. Because after knight takes d4, now we can play bishop takes c5, and we might have some pin threats over here. But then, after, takes, after bishop takes c5, we have knight takes e6 and f takes e6. So now white has the bishop pair, which means he has the two bishops, and black doesn't. So technically, white's minor pieces are a little bit better because of the two bishops. But I feel like black's pieces are a little bit more active. So it sort of balances out, and maybe slightly in favor of black. So now we have bishop to g4, developing our other bishop. You might be wondering, why can't I simply take this bishop? Well, then you would lose your queen. But then, there may even be some ideas, right? So what will happen is maybe we'll have some bishop f2 or knight f2 ideas, and it's actually completely fine, right? So then what can happen is, after bishop g4, we have queen d6. Looking at the h2 pawn, we're not attacking anything yet, but we're just looking at it. And then we have bishop h3, probably to guard this g2 square. I didn't really like this move, it's very inactive and very passive. And right away, black is, count, uh, is taking advantage on that, playing rook a to e8. So now he's controlling the center, right? He wants to keep his rooks in the center, and he wants to make a push, right? And then we have queen to d2. Maybe preparing some kingside attack, but there's nothing serious. Bishop b4, we're going to pin this knight to the queen. And then we have bishop takes f6. And then we have rook takes f6. And then we have rook a d1. So now white's bringing his rooks in the center, which is good for white. Now we have queen to c5, putting more pressure on the c3 square. And then we have queen to e2. Possibly thinking of some bishop e6 idea later on. And then after we have queen to e2, we can play bishop takes c3, and then b takes c3, and queen takes c3. So now we win a pawn. 
And now our position's looking pretty good, I'm not going to lie. Very nice position. But we always have to watch out for tactics, right? Because there might be moves like rook takes d5 later on, when after e takes d5, we have queen takes e8. And then that's very bad. So, what happens is, after queen takes e3, we do have rook takes d5, but here we have an intermediate move. We play knight to d4. So, why, you might be wondering, well, let's see, when rook takes d5 happens, we know that we can't play e takes d5, correct? Because after we have queen takes e8. So knight d4 here attacks the queen and protects this e6 pawn, so now we're playing a little bit more solid. And now we have queen to h5, threatening this e8 rook. But wait a minute, is this good? Rook e to f8, now we're piling lots of pressure. We really have to watch out now. And then we have rook to e5, maybe going after the e6 pawn or something. And then we have rook to h6. Uh-oh, this is getting worse. Oh no, our queen's under attack. This is not good. This is not good at all. Queen to g4, I think. Oh no, sorry, sorry, queen to g5. And then we have rook takes h3. Boom. Sacrifice. Nope, this isn't the best move. Just keep watching. So now what happens is, after, if they take with this pawn, we can simply play knight to f3 check. And then we have a queen and a rook to eat. So let's say the king moves somewhere. Then simply we can take the queen. Right? So they didn't take g takes h3. Instead what they played is they played rook c5. Trying to attack this queen. But oh boy, here's the move. The greatest move of all time. Still controversial, but still. Queen to g3. Wow, what a move. You might be wondering... Wait a minute, doesn't this just blunder our queen three different ways? Well, you could be right, but let's see. So, since this rook and this f2 pawn, it's still very dangerous, so we have to take advantage. So, if nothing happens, let's say they move their queen somewhere or do something, then simply we can play queen takes h2, right? So then they should take with one of their pieces. So let's say they take with h takes g3. Then we also have a mate in two, a very nice one. Knight to e2, which is a wonderful checkmate. But let's say, okay, I'll take with this pawn now. Well, that's still fine. We still have knight e2. But it's not checkmate, since the king can come over here. But then we have to take advantage of this rook. And then we can play rook takes f1. And a wonderful checkmate. So, white resigns here. But let's think. After queen takes g3, what happens? Well... It's still fine for us. We can play knight to e2. The king moves somewhere. And we can play brilliant knight takes g3. And it might be fine for white if they could recapture. But they can't. Since if they take back this way, they fall into the same checkmate. And they cannot take back this way because they are pinned. Right? Okay guys, I really hope you enjoyed this video. It's the greatest move. I really like this move. Queen to g3, just look at it, look how nice it is. And please be sure to subscribe, like once again, and share with friends and family. It really does mean a lot. Thank you so much for your support, and see you soon.